Hi, my friends. This is Cece Evans Puglisi, and welcome to a brand new episode of Half Ass to Badass. Wait, what? What's going on here? <laughs> How do entrepreneurs, business owners, and experts influence themselves, their clients, and teams to maximize profitability, efficiency, and create lasting impact? How do they simplify life and business and yet still achieve more? What's the one thing separating the mediocre from the best? This podcast will give you the answers and reveal the secret strengths and the not-so-easy-to-admit flaws that you need. My name is Satori Mateo, and welcome to the half Ass to Badass Podcast. In today's episode of Half Ass to Badass, the tables are turned, and you will hear me be interviewed by entrepreneur, psychoanalyst, wife, and homeschooling mom of five, Cece Evans. She's also a fellow badass listener of our podcast, and you will hear her ask me some challenging and some interesting questions. Let's get into the episode. Okay, the tables are turned. So we're in this conversation today, and it's going to be very different than what you're used to. And uh, I've opened it up so... I will be asked questions, and uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. I'm totally, uh, I'm totally yours here. Just, I'm gonna be vulnerable with you. <laughs> Whatever you okay. want. Okay. Okay. So, Satori, we have known each other. I've been just uh, caught up in all that you do. I've been on the other side of your work, and I just find you extraordinarily gifted at what you do and the way that you showcase people just really just lights me up every time I talk to you. But when I'm listening, and I'm always listening to your podcasts, what I'm always noticing is that because you're so otherly and because you really center on your guests and on your interviews, sometimes I miss the other side. Sometimes I want to see and hear you on the other side of your provocative questions. And so it's my hope that today I'm not alone. I think that there are a lot of people that listen to you and that know your work and they want to hear a little bit more from you because you offer gold to people and I want them to receive it. So can I ask you a few questions that I hear you asking other people? I would just like to turn the tables today and ask them of you, my friend. Can I do that? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so now you always say, I think the first question on every interview that I've heard is you say, ask, what is the definition of a badass? Yes. So I'm asking you, Satori, what is the definition of a badass? Great question. <laughs> okay, so first of all, I believe that a definition of badass, and there's many perspectives of it, right? So, uh, I'm happy to drill deep and, and see the different perspectives. I'll, I'll give you some of the things that I that I perceive a badass is to begin with, and then um, and if if it doesn't answer the question fully, then we can go deeper. Sound Got good? It. Okay. Perfect. So I believe some of the traits is number one is a badass is focused, right? They're focused. They're deliberate, and they're really they're intentional. And they own their worth. And what I mean by owning their worth is that they're not letting guilt and shame drive their behaviors or how they show up in the world. Meaning that they're being themselves and not being apologetic. I mean, they're unapologetic about who they are and about what they want to create or do in their life. They're not minimizing themselves to make others more comfortable. And to clarify that, this doesn't mean that they go out of their way to be uncaring or just to try to be rebellious, right? But what it really means to me is that they don't need to prove anything because they have the courage to stand out, living according to their values, to their mission, to their purpose, and not trying to fit into someone else's. And that's why I say they, they're deliberate. Got it. No, that's so good. So when you think about... Are there any gender differences? Like, do you notice, are these just traits that show up in both genders, that focus, that being deliberate, um, owning their worth? Are there any gender differences? Like, does it, does it switch at all between men and women when you think about who shows up as a badass? That's a great question. I mean, I, 
you know, in a general sense, right? And and I try not to be general, but in general sense, you can look at it from the perspective that you know we're so conditioned um, in this world, in, in our culture, that women are are a little bit more subdued and more quiet and stuff like that, right? But I think that's that's it, that is shifting rapidly, and and so from a place of from the core. The truth is, and, and well, I guess we'll, we'll get to the question about being half-assed, but I think from the core of being a badass, there's no difference. Meaning, mm-hmm. if the trait of a, ba- a badass is there, I think that these are the things that are there. They are focused, they're deliberate, they're intentional, they're owning their worth, they're unapologetic. They don't ask for permission to create the life they want. And they always strive to optimize and grow. They don't settle. Yes. No, that's so good. Now, my best friend was an English teacher, like a, an award-winning English teacher. And she told me the way that you know the definition of a word is to contrast it. So to really know a word, you have to know its opposite. So tell me, what is the definition of half-ass? Mm, great question. Okay, so I look at from that perspective, I mean, obviously, we could say they're the opposite, right? We could say, well, they're unfocused, they're <laughs> they're not deliberate, right? They're undeliberate, and they're they don't have intention, right? And they're not owning the worth, and they're being apologetic. But look at it from a little bit deeper. I look at it as half asses. They have the mindset of the or the willingness to live an okay life, meaning they're settling and they live in that mediocre place. But I think that even deeper than that, they don't put the effort or caring to something. And I look, we can look at that in many different aspects, right? You can look in a, in a marriage, as a, you know, as a parent, in their business, right? In, in their health, right? It's like, if you think about it, if you want to be, have a deep connection or intimacy with your partner or a half-ass, are just not intentionally doing something to be more loving, more caring. You know, they're not going out of their way to really make that marriage special, right? Or they they don't do something intentionally to make their business better. They're just doing something, and whatever shows up shows up, right? They're, it's okay, right? Uh, but I also look at it as that not letting your fears run the show. So I'll give you an example. I had a, a client that came to me, and she said to me, "You know, wow, you know, I, I really, I just wish that you would take me on as a client. I really would love to to have you mentor me." And uh, all, everything she described sounded so perfect. Like in my mind, I was like, "Wow, this this would be the dream client, <laughs> right?" And as, as we started working. I noticed that she was really working really hard to position herself as being having it all together, um, being perfect, um, looking good. Like all the different aspects of, of her life was try to showcase her being a badass. But what really showed up is that her fears, her insecurities, uh, led her down a path where, when it came down to really pushing herself, like. I, I literally, I helped her become a best-selling author, and we, we did a lot of work together. And she was a therapist. And so when it came down to doing the actual work of her actually, like, stepping up in, into the world, I noticed that she was half-assing things. Or in a, on a service, we could say, you know, you're, you're half-assing things, blah, blah, blah. But it was really her fears running the show. It was the fears that she had uh, that she wouldn't be good enough the fears that that she would be in some way people would see her flaws so so what i mean is that it may show up as being a half it may look like a half assing thing <laughs> if i could say that but it was really her fears running her show so i said to her you know I, i'm happy to help you through this but you need you need to be willing to uh, be intentional and deliberate about making this happen or or it won't work and you know in some cases that happens like she decided to to stop the mentorship because she wasn't willing to to go there, and that happens sometimes. But yeah, to me, someone that does half assing things, they're they're not focused, they're not deliberate, they're not intentional, they're not living on purpose. And when you think about that, I love how you said that. I mean, there are some people that just really do 
settle for an okay life, right? And they're just stuck inside those bands of mediocrity. What do you think drives that? Like, what do you think? Is it the fear? Is it the insecurities that you just talked about with your client? Is that what keeps us stuck? Will we just become okay with showing up in a mediocre way because our insecurity or our fears are greater than our desire to show up big? Well, I, I believe that we, we are, we're stuck in mediocrity. We're stuck there because we forgot mm -hmm. that we are naturally born badasses. We're naturally born badasses. We're, we're naturally born like, you know, I jokingly, I mean, jokingly say this, but, you know, when you were that little sperm, you won the race. And you prove that by being first of millions and millions, right? I mean, you show that. And so somewhere along the line, you were indoctrinated to believe that you were not a badass. And so you start to settle for mediocrity. And, and it's, not, it's not, you know, trying to be funny or cute about it. It's like, it's the truth. You know, because if you really think about it, when we let guilt and shame run the show, which is just other people's values placed on you, injected into your life, saying people, other people projecting their values onto you and saying that when you do this, when you do that, you're bad, you're not good, right? Or you should feel bad about this, right? Whatever that is, uh, whether it's how you run your business or how you act, you know, as a parent or, you know, just from being a kid, right? You know, a kid being, being told, you know, be quiet, shut up, don't talk too much, don't ask too many questions, you know, any of those kind of comments will leave the traces of someone that feels guilt and shame and, and shuts down and minimizes and apologizes and don't show up. So I think that mediocrity is that society rewards mediocrity. In a way, if you think about it, it's ugly to stand out. Right? We want to fit in. So it's, it's shown to be not a good thing. So being mediocre, it keeps you connected or, or bound to the tribe. So you don't stand out. But I believe that the leaders of the world, the people that have most influence today, they have the courage, and not only the courage, but they also they have the, the hunger and the desire fueled by knowing that they are a natural-born badass and they're not going to be apologetic about it. And the leaders of the world today, they have the courage to stand out. They're not willing to fit in. And I think that's a big difference. Can you think of a time in your life where you showed up feeling mediocre and then made a decision that this was not how you were willing to show up and moved into becoming a badass. Yeah, I mean, I think that has, has happened many times. Uh, I, I mean, as I grew up, I, I grew up being apologetic. I grew up always trying to be nice because I was taught that being nice is a good thing. Um, I, come, I mean, you know, being nice, I don't know how many parents have told their kids, be nice, be nice, <laughs> right? And not understanding what that means, but being nice to me meant, you know, don't be too loud, um, you know, don't, don't bother people, um, don't do this, don't do that, like all these different things that we've been told as we grew up. So I believe that for me, you know, even when I was a world champion in karate and I had my own martial arts school, I noticed myself being apologetic, uh, meaning that I didn't want to, you know, make any parent uncomfortable uh, or any you know, adult that came, came to me, make them uncomfortable because I thought if I do that, they're going to be mad at me. And if they get mad at me, they're not going to want to, uh, you know, continue taking classes from me. So I would mute myself. I would like diminish myself and... Doing that obviously made me mediocre because I wasn't able to really showcase the best version of me. Think about relationships. I've done that in, in intimate relationships too, right? Wanting to please, you know, putting the person on the pedestal because you want them to like you. And so you kind of change who you are, change how you do things so that you will get the appreciation, the respect, the love, and... Yeah, I've done that many times. And, and I can, if I think about it, looking back, to it, I've done that with my kids too, right? <laughs> like they, 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 uh, they look cute. They try to persuade you to want something and like, okay, you know, you, you say yes, even though you don't feel like it, but you want them to like you. 
So I think that the the honesty of level of looking at that is where am I being apologetic and minimize myself, which is also a way of being mediocre because you're not standing for what you really believe or what you really want or feel in the moment. Mm-hmm. So when you are thinking about this with me, how can someone become a badass? What if someone listening today really identifies with how you describe someone more half ass How can they become a badass? Is it willpower? Is it decision? Is it habit? What are your thoughts? Great question. So, like I said earlier, being intentional, right? But what does that mean? Well, it's like not being casual, not being casual about what you want. Right? Not being casual about the things that you see around you and, you know, ignore it. So I look at it as that in order to do that and in order to be intentional, I think that number one, which really goes down to a lot of the, a lot of the frameworks or the faces that I work with when I work with a client is to have clarity of where you are and what you want. And clarity, looking at different perspectives that you got to have clarity not only about where you are and what you want, but looking at clarity in, in many different layers. Clarity about how you think. Clarity of how you feel. Clarity about how you behave. Clarity about the habits that you have. So clarity, right? And clarity about what it would look like if you didn't have the limitations, if you didn't live through the pain, if you were not stuck in your business, stuck in your marriage, stuck in your you know, parenting, if you were not you know, stuck in your health, whatever that is. Having clarity about that, what, what will life be like? What will it look like? What would it feel like? Without limitations, without the pain, without the struggle. So having clarity, number one. Having intention to that clarity. Like, first of all, making the decision that I want to be intentional about this and not be casual about it. So that's, that's number one, being, having clarity. Two is being willing to let go and eliminate the things that are not serving you. To eliminate, to, to explore, to be curious about the elimination process of the things that are no longer serving you. They have been serving you. And they are serving you or you wouldn't be doing it. But if you want to change it, if you want to shift it, is to have the, the honesty, the brutal honesty to own your shit, right? In such a respect that you're, lo- you're willing to look at it, to explore it without judgment, without criticism, not putting yourself down, but be willing to observe where you get stuck, where you are, where you are you know, struggling, but also looking at where you're succeeding, but being, being willing to eliminate the stuff that's not, no longer moving you along the path at the speed that you want. So clarity number one. Number two is to be able to eliminate the stuff that's not serving you. And number three, the phase number three is setting structures that support what you're looking to achieve. Right? Understanding the, the, the actual habits that are needed and required to get there. Right? Like I say to a lot of people that come to me and say, you know, they say I want to make more money. Okay, great. And so where do you block time in your day to actually attract new clients? Where do you spend time in your day consistently make that happen, to serve new people, to have conversations? So if you don't have that as a habit, well, Stop fantasizing about becoming financially free, right? Or if you or or, or saving money. Let's say you, you know you have you make an income. Are you intentionally saving, putting away money? Are you paying yourself first, right? Or are you not? If you're not paying yourself first, don't expect to be financially free, right? If you want an intimate, you know, connected marriage, but you have no time intentionally being present with your partner, you letting your 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 social media come first, you making TV shows come first, you making everything and everyone else come first, and you're wondering why your marriage is dead? Well, think again. You're not intentional. You don't have you don't have clarity about what you want, right? And if you think you you don't know your kids, or if you think that you're, you know, 10, 20, 30 pounds overweight, well, what are you making more important? Putting stuffing yourself with, with food? 
letting your thoughts about your desires being more important than actually thinking bigger than your feelings. And I think that's a critical thing. A lot of times we don't think bigger than how we feel. So we get into these habits. We have these internal habits that just go on automatic pilot. So when we feel this urge to do something, we're letting that feeling, because it's so automatic and so conditioned, that we don't think bigger than how we feel. And therefore, we just get stuck in automatic habits and we have mediocrity on our hands. No, that's so, so good. I love it. Actually, I so, forgot. <laughs> I actually, uh, I, anyway, I, I get stuck in that. So anyway, which, clear, yeah. clear, so, so my steps to becoming a badass is being intentional, but having clarity, being willing yeah. to eliminate the stuff, setting the structures. And once you've done that, you get to the next phase, which is about momentum. And mm-hmm. momentum is about executing on the habits that we created, the structures, so executing on the structures. Having momentum is implementing the structures and the habits. And once you create momentum and you create that roll, that, that snowball effect, it takes you to the, to the last phase, which I call evolve. And, it, and in the evolving phase, we're continuously evaluating and tweaking and upgrading our growth. So again, we're intentional. It's like the, the intentional thing, it's what goes through the, all of it, right? So when we evolve, we realize that as we're growing, we're deliberately growing. So now we're evolving because we're evaluating what's happening. So now we take it to the next level. So now we're starting again with clarity, the next level of clarity, the next level of elimination of structure, momentum, and evolving again. So it's a, it's a, it's a constant flow of it. Like a lot of people think, you know, you know, in personal development and, you know, even in business, if I just reach this level, then I'm going to be happy. No, it's like when you reach that level, you graduate to the next level. Now you have a bigger problem, a better problem, a more significant problem, right? And now you get cleared again. So it's, you know, people go to, you know, a lot of people go to, to uh, personal development courses and they think like, if I only get to this thing, then, then everything's going to be great. But it's just a continuous evolvement upgrading upgrading your life which which reminds me i'm not just keep talking right let me just share this 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 idea this thought that i that i that, that came to me i realized this, this um actually it was yesterday i i came to this conclusion i had an infrared sauna and uh you know every time i come out of the infrared sauna i feel so uh so peaceful and so clear i was talking to my wife and we we're having this conversation and she said i don't know she asked me something i realized that I'm all about optimization, like life optimization, entrepreneurial optimization, marriage optimization, whatever optimization. And here's what I remembered. When I was a kid, I used to sit in the back seat in the car when my, when my dad was driving, and I used to look out, and this happened in many different atmospheres, but I remember clearly sitting in the car and driving by cars. So this, is, this is back in Sweden where a lot of the cars were very rusty. Right, it had a lot of rust. So I would look at the cars, right? Because the basically the the salt from the and when they would try to make the salt on the on the in the snow to make people be able to drive their cars and not you know fall, they put salt on the on the streets. But that that salt basically ate the cars. You know what I mean? Uh, so a lot of cars would be rusty, and I would be always thinking like, ah, oh, that that car would be slow. You know, what could we do to make that car look nicer? Mm-hmm. You know, or I would drive by in you know, a building that looked kind of you know, crap, you know, like, how can you make that building look nicer? Or I would look at, you know, somebody being dressed in a certain way, and I'm like, how can they dress nicer? You know, but I was always like, thinking about how do you upgrade things? And I realized that throughout my whole life, I always thought, how can we make things better? How can we optimize things? And I realized that that's kind of been a thread through my whole life, even when I worked with couples, when I worked with, with entrepreneurs, when I worked with, with parents, like it doesn't matter what area, it's all about how do we optimize the thinking, the feeling, the behaviors, the habit, whatever that is. So it just made me think about that, that I'm the optimization guy. <laughs> no, I love that. I mean, would it be too big of a question to ask you for like tiny little hacks into all those areas that you just mentioned as entrepreneurs in marriage, just those tiny pieces for optimizing? Is that too much to ask? No, that's great. I th- but I think you're going to have to guide me more specifically. Like, 
Yes, ask me specifically so I, so I can give you some specific answers. Well, let me just take me to a time where you helped a couple optimize their marriage. Okay. Or, or you optimized your own. Okay. Great question. So I, I, there's, there's so many stories. I mean, because I've done this for 25 plus years, so there's so many different directions. But I have many examples. One principle, and it's not a, a uh, breakthrough idea, but it's a, it's a principle that I remember adopting for myself. And that's the principle of not threatening your marriage. So what I mean by that is that, you know, a lot of times, and I've, so I've seen this many times in couples that I work with, but also I've seen it, you know, I've been in part of relationships like that when, when, you know, you had an argument, you have a discussion, and the person starts threatening the relationship. Well, well, I guess we're not meant to be together, right? Or, well, let's just get to divorce, right? They, they use, they use um, the divorce or the, you know, breaking up as a weapon when they don't get what they want, when they get upset, right? When, when their fantasy is being challenged, right? When their expectations are not being met. So for example, a specific upgrade were, for me was that no matter how upset I am, unless I really mean it, I would never threaten the marriage because, it, well, the underlying thinking around that or behind that is that I know that one of the biggest things that shakes us in life is to believe that we're not good enough, that we're not loved. And so understanding that, I realize that you must never put your partner in a place where they feel like they're not good enough, that they're not loved, and that that core wound will be triggered. So that was kind of the thing, like that principle, it just became the filter through how I, how I operate. Like, I would never want to put my partner through that. Mm. Which really came into a really interesting, in, interesting conversation that I had with a, with a couple of clients the other day. Um, I was writing this, 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 um, this scenario, this copy for them. And then I broke down the, the message that I sent or why I did the way I did. And it's interesting enough, the very first sentence that was designed in this message to their clients was all about acknowledging that client. Because it kind of goes as the message behind everything that if you, are, if you can help someone to feel seen, to feel understood, to feel like they matter, then the ability to impact them and help them opens up because you're, you're telling them, I see you, I, I care about you. So that's kind of the, the thread that goes through all of it. And so I, I adopted that in, in, in business, I adopted that in my marriage, I adopted that in, in a, as a parent, right? And to look at that, that if I can make a person feel well, I don't make them feel, but if I can assist in having them feel seen and understood and appreciated for who they are, then it opens up everything. That's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Can I just add a tiny bit, just a reference that I wonder if you've seen this or heard this quote, but I have a client that has actively working on, on documentaries. So every time he watches one that's great, I watch it too. And one of the ones that he is uh, just saw that really touched him was, won't you be my neighbor on Mr. Rogers? And in that movie, in that documentary, he, Mr. Rogers says, the greatest evil a person can commit is making someone feel smaller than they really are. Mm. I love that. Yeah, it's great. But, so it just so complimented what you're saying. And I think you do that so well, how you really see people, you really care, you really know how to nurture and nourish your relationships. Thank you. It's a beautiful quality. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a hack in, 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 I don't know if that was a hack, but you know, for yeah. marriage, but oh. also going to business as well. When you think about 
being a badass. Do we make a decision once to become a badass or do we have to make that decision over and over again? How do you see that? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think that I believe strongly that once you, once you know, first of all, that you are, right? Once you remember that you are and know that and you don't question that, you don't have to go back and forth. The reason, mm-hmm. the only reason why people go back and forth is they have, they have mixed uh, associations, mixed emotions, and they're living, they're trying to live according to other people's values and also in their own values. So because of that, they're vacillating, they're going back and forth, they're oscillating back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And the truth is, is that they're in conflict. So their brain becomes incoherent and it creates a lot of friction, a lot of overwhelm, a lot of stress. And and the incoherence of the brain and their heart is not sinking. And because of that, they're not being themselves. So I believe that when you are aligning your values and you're aligning your neurology, right? When you're removing the guilt and shame that has been running their life, most of their life, they become, you know, in, in, in a simple way that people call, call it in psychology, you know, it's being congruent, right? Psychologically, emotionally congruent with what they believe, how they feel, and how they behave, right? They're not being... T- there's no tug and war. There's, they're not being pulled in different directions. So once you remember and understand the truth, right, and you're not letting yourself be sucked in by other people's demands of how you think you should be, then you just know you are a badass and you won't budge from that. And therefore, it's interesting. Sometimes we go into certain environments that where we'll be triggered, but the key to remember, if you're getting triggered... You're living in the past. You're not living in the present. You're living in the past, and you're dragging the past with you to the present. And when you do that, there's no chance to have a different future. Mm. When you think about this, what are? Can you find a time or a couple of times in your life when you thought there is no return to half-ass? I've discovered who I am, and I'm a badass. I'm not going back right? Can you think of a, an occasion or two that you really tapped on that inside your life when you really were owned your identity as a badass? Yeah, I think I have many moments like that, meaning that it's been a process of, of elimination. It's been a process of cleaning up and pruning old neural connections, old pathways in my brain that's been conditioned. So it's not a one-time thing. It's been a, a, a like I said, a, a pruning, a cutting away process. But I think that the, the core of my being is always looking to be an own of being a badass. And of course, in certain environments that have may triggered me, I noticed myself maybe being apologetic or not being as 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 big or bold or you know certain in the environment that I that I've been in and i realize that when i when that happens is is usually because i am in some way comparing myself to someone else that i fall into the trap thinking that someone is superior to me or thinking that they have something that i don't when i believe that lie then i i kind of minimize myself Instead Mm -hmm. of just not comparing myself and just owning who I am. Mm -hmm. No, that's the better way, right? Because there's so much despair on the other side of comparing, right? And all that despair is just in the confines of our mind, right? Right. This is something I so appreciate about you. And I just had to ask you about this because I have never heard you and I have had so many conversations with you. I have never heard you go into victimhood. And I just really appreciate that about you. But I also want to, I'm super curious, do you ever get tempted? <laughs> That's a good question. And if, you, and if you do, I would love to hear where. Okay, you get great question. So I think it's important to maybe kind of, kind of define a little bit what victimhood really means. Because uh, I think it's so insidious. It's so 
hap in our culture, in our world, period. It, I mean, victimhood is everywhere. You know, with every kind of movements that are out there, you know, whether it's Me Too movement or any, whatever movement or, or life, it's so victimhoody. <laughs> okay? But what I mean by that is, so to me, the definition of to look at it, because it's, it's so easy to, to, to not see it when it's happening. And I think we do it in so many different ways. So the, first of all, the answer is, do I go into victimhood? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, now I'm able to see it quicker and be able to stop it or remove it when it happens. But let me clarify what I mean by victim, what I, how I see it. When you think that something is happening to you or not happening for you, and you feel either angry, disappointed, uh, you know, frustration, any, any of those things that happen, when you go into those emotional states, it's the belief that something is happening to you or not for you, that someone should do something for you. I mean, we can be victims to the weather, you know. We can, we can look at the weather and it's raining and be like, oh, it's raining and get upset. That's being a victim to the weather, right? We can be stuck in driving in traffic and someone is right in front of us and getting pissed off and thinking, you know, how can this idiot be so thoughtless and just, you know, break right in front of me? I mean, don't they see, like, me being the king of the road? Don't they see that they shouldn't bother me? Right? <laughs> I mean, so we can be victims in many, many arenas. And so it could be anything. I mean, <laughs> just going back to couples, I can say, you know, people being upset when their partner, you know, their husband doesn't, put down the seat at the toilet on the toilet right or doesn't you know put away the milk or whatever that is right people can get upset about anything and so i think just to understand that being a victim or acting from a place of a victim it shows up in so many different ways so do i get ever get tempted yeah i mean if i look at my kids when they don't do exactly what i want them to do i can get frustrated i can be irritated and or, or disappointed if they don't listen to me right away, well, it comes from the, from the fantasy, the, the actual expectation I, that I have that they should always do what I want them to do, to never disobey me, right? to always follow my directions at all times, no question about it. If I get upset in those moments, I'm being a victim. So do I ever go there? Yes. But I can capture it, see when it happens, and stop it. And I look at it, it's not, it's not so much... <clears throat> can I get upset? The question is, can I stop myself and can I correct it? Mm. Can I apologize for being an idiot thinking that they're going to do exactly what I want whenever I want at all times, right? Check yourself. Mm -hmm. Right? And same thing in my marriage, right? If I think, if I believe that my wife is always going to do what I want her to do, whatever I want her to do, right, that... Uh, that'll be an illusion, right? That'll be living in a fantasy. If I think that she's always going to say yes and never say no, right? If I think that she's always going to be uh, uh, elegant in her communication and never sound snappy or never sound uh, irritated or frustrated, that's me living in a fantasy and having false expectations of how, how, how she should be. So mm -hmm. if I feel hurt or feel upset or frustrated, that's me being a victim. So we can be victims in so many different ways, right? Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, not that long ago, the, uh, I, was, I was calling the bank and because my credit cards were blocked, right? And I was in a store, and that pissed me off. I was like, fuck? I'm like trying to call the bank. I mean, trying to use my credit card, and I can't use it. And I know there's money there. So what's happening here? Well... They wanted to protect me from fraud. But I'm inconvenienced because I have to, not only can I not use my credit card, I have to call the bank. And not only that, but they're going to send me a new card because they had a fraud suspicion. Which means that everything that I have on automation, I have to call all these <laughs> places to get, you know, put in my new card. All the things that I have on automatic, right? On auto pay. So I felt inconvenienced. <laughs> that's being a victim mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah uh, it happens what is the interplay what is the correlation between victimhood and 
being half ass? Great question. So if we look at being a victim or feeling like we're living in, in this kind of victimhood, right? Or being a half ass, I believe that when you're living in victimhood, you are blaming. You're blaming circumstances. You're blaming people. You're blaming time. Right? You maybe blaming you know life. And when we do that, we're settling because we're not being the best version of ourselves. So we have fasting things. When we are in victimhood and blaming things, we're, we're not taking ownership. So we're removing ourselves from the ability to take charge. We're not in command anymore. And so when we're not in command anymore, we are in reaction. And when we are in reaction, our life's going to be filled with other people's demands, other people's interruptions, right? Disruptions and minimizing ourselves, we're removing our own power. Having said that, it's impossible to be a badass doing that because you're, you're not being in the driver's seat. You're not being in command of your life. So you're being in reaction and being victimized. Half, you can't be a badass and being a victim at the same time. It's just impossible. Because when you're in victimhood, you are living in reaction to life, to people, to time, and, and your environment. That's so good, Satori. So good. One last question. I'm mean, because I think both of us could go on because I have so many more. <laughs> yeah, we and should I definitely think- have. A, we should. We should make another another round of this. A, a deep round of of part two. <laughs> That's so good. I have to ask you this though. What drives you? Uh, that's a great question. There's so many things that drive me, but I would say the core of my drive is to, like, my insight that I had yesterday, right? Optimization. Uh, being a kid and wanting things to make things better. At, at the end of the day, it's to end mediocrity and victimhood. To allow people to remove the chains of victimhood and mediocrity that stops them from having the life that is really available to them to see the possibilities. So to me, it's about allowing people to remove all the, the things that stop them from being and having everything that they want to have in life. So good. I just love your thinking. I so thank you for answering these questions. I feel like I got to know you in a level that I've wanted to hear you in your podcast. And at some point soon, I think we're going to have to go on because you just have so much gold inside of you. And if I can be any part of helping you draw it out, I want to be. Thank you. Yeah, it's very different to actually have questions asked <laughs> like that than uh, just trying to you know, come up with a good topic to talk about. So this is cool. I love this. Yes, I do too. I love that you're willing to take risks and change things and that you're always open. Thank you. Well, this is cool. That was fun. Let's do it again. Okay, my friend. Have a great day and let's do it again soon. Yes. Okay, bye, Satori. Bye. Boom! How did you like that? Hey, if you're thinking, I want some more hands-on training, I wish I had someone who could keep me accountable, keep my mindset straight, and help me grow. And if you want to be part of a community of badasses just like yourself, you can go to halfasstobadass.com and join the waitlist because we are in the middle of creating something super cool. And if you're liking this experience, the community we're building will blow your mind for sure. We haven't officially opened the doors yet, but by getting your name on the VIP list, you will be the first to know when we go live. Sound exciting? We are very excited. Actually, the more accurate word would be inspired. I can't wait to share this with you. So it's super easy. Just go to halfassedbadass.com and get yourself on the VIP list right now. Talk soon.